the second salawat for the love of Fatima al Zahra alayhi salam. For the love of Sayyidah Khadija, a third salawat in the loudest of your voices. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان اللعين الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين ثم الصلاة والسلام على خاتم الأنبياء والمرسلين سيدنا ونبينا محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين ولعنة الله على أعدائهم ومنكر فضائلهم من الآن إلى قيام يوم الدين رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي Respected elders, brothers and sisters, السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته سليمان عليه السلام was a young boy when his father Dawood passed away. And he married at a very young age. And even as a young person, he was thinking about having a child. He was already thinking about having an heir. And soon after his marriage, he discovered that his wife was pregnant. Now with every passing month, he was eagerly waiting for the birth of what he assumed would be a son who would be the heir apparent to his mighty kingdom. In his mind, he was already preparing a succession plan. Now again, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had not revealed to him that you will have a son and your son will inherit you and he will carry on your legacy and he will continue to protect your kingdom. It was something that he was thinking about. And therefore, he was devising his own plan on how to protect a kingdom that was built by his father, Dawood, and a kingdom that he was making great strides in building. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the way that he deals with his prophets is unlike the way that he deals with ordinary people. Sometimes Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is quite stern with his prophets when they make a small error in judgment, not a sin, prophets are infallible. They never do anything that would constitute a legal sin. But sometimes they do things that fall below the high standard that he has set for them. So Dawood alayhi salam, as the months are passing, He's waiting so anxiously for a son to be given to him so that he could groom him to be the heir who would inherit this massive kingdom. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decides to test the, uh, Sulaiman with a severe trial. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surah Sa'd, Surah 38, Ayah 34. We tried Sulaiman. We disciplined him. By doing what? وَأَلْقَيْنَا عَلَىٰ كُرْسِيِّهِ جَسَدًا ثُمَّ أَنَابٍ His wife gave birth, but she gave birth and it was a stillborn. 
And the Quran says that when he walked into his courtyard, when he walked into his court, the lifeless body of his newborn son was laying on his throne. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the next ayah, he quotes Sulaiman. Sulaiman realized the mistake that he had made. Not the sin, but the mistake. قَالَ رَبِّ اغْفِرْ لِي Oh Allah, forgive me. Forgive me for allowing, my, allowing myself to get ahead of myself. Forgive me for trying to extend my authority over my material possessions by devising a plan as to who is going to take over this kingdom. He realized that he was being quite presumptuous. Who said that this authority would be given to your son? Yes, you inherited from your father. But who says that your sons will inherit from you? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not give you his endorsement for this. Dawood alayhi salam had a successor like you. But who says that you're going to be given a similar gift? Yusuf alayhi salam, your great forefather. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decreed that the line of Nubuwa would not continue through his line. It would continue through the line of Levi. So it was a moment of presumptuousness. And Sulaiman, just like his father, Sulaiman, just like his father Dawood, when they make the smallest errors, they turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As though they have committed a major moral indiscretion. Rabbi ghfirli, oh Allah, forgive me. Forgive me for thinking that I am the one who plans. And look at what he says next. He loses his child. And he says, وَهَبْ لِي مُلْكًا لَا يَنْبَغِي لِأَحَدٍ مِّن بَعْدِي He then says to Allah, Oh Allah, grant me a kingdom that is not fitting for anyone after me. Meaning, give me a kingdom that is unparalleled. Give me an empire that is unprecedented. Now when you read this, you're probably wondering, is Sulaiman being greedy? Why is he asking for this mighty kingdom? Was he being motivated by greed? Of course not. This is Sulaiman. This is a man of deep ma'rifah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What was he asking? He was not actually asking for the dunya. This dua, in fact, was the ultimate act of zuhd. He was essentially asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to subject him to one of the most difficult trials in life. And that is to be given immense power and wealth and to not have any control over what its ultimate fate is. This is what Sulaiman wanted. Oh Allah, I want you to give me the dunya and everything in it. And as you give me this massive empire, I want to show you that in my heart, I have no qualms with relinquishing, relinquishing it and giving it away. I'm okay not knowing what's going to happen to all of this. I surrender this all to you. I don't have a succession plan. I've tried to plan and to plot, but I've realized that you have another decree. You know, and this is an important lesson for us, brothers and sisters. Some of us, we are obsessed with controlling every area of our lives. 
And I'm not saying that we should be reckless. We should plan. But there reaches a point in your life where you just have to surrender to Allah. You know, you get in the car, you can put the seatbelt on, you can drive as cautiously as possible. But in the end, you have to just relinquish control to Him. You have to say that I've done everything that I can and I voluntarily and happily submit to you. You do whatever you see fit. He wanted to control his empire and protect it and to ensure a smooth transition of power after his death. But he realized that this was not in the cards, as they say. So through this dua, he's basically saying to Allah, I relinquish it to you. I'll let you determine what is best. You know, sometimes we are so obsessed with trying to figure out what Allah's plan is for us. You know, sometimes our job is not to figure out what God's plan is. It's just to submit and surrender to His plan, whether you know how it will unfold or not. It's just like Musa السلام, when he when he arrived at the Red Sea and the forces of Fir'aun are behind him and the Red Sea is in front of him. All he knows is Allah is going to save me. Allah is not going to let me down. But do you think Musa in his wildest dream thought that the staff that he had in his hands all these years would be the key to split the Red Sea. Musa knew that Allah would save him, but he didn't know how it was going to happen. He surrendered to the plan of God, but he didn't know what the details of that plan was. So Sulaiman salam, after he makes this dua, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he granted him what he asked for. And Allah azza wa jal gave Sulaiman, a kingdom that was truly unmatched. He gave him abilities that he had not given to any of his predecessors. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surah Sa'd, ayah 36, He gives us some glimpses into some of the unique powers that he had given Sulaiman. فَسَخَّرْنَا لَهُ الرِّيَاحِ Allah says, I made the winds subservient to him. Imagine, the wind was subservient to Sulaiman. تَجْرِي بِأَمْرِ The wind doesn't blow on its own. No, it blows in accordance with the command of Sulaiman. Imagine that type of power. That is immense power. You know, wind is a potentially destructive force and it's also a constructive force. Wind, for example, is a very good agent of pollination. But at the same time, it can cause great devastation. What did Sulaiman do with you know, what you and I would call Incredible technology, the ability to manipulate the wind. He could have done anything he wanted with the wind. What does he do? What does he do with that type of power? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us, Wali Sulaiman al Rih, Surat al Anbiya, Ayah 81, Wali Sulaiman al Rih, Asifa ten tejri bi amri, Il al Arv il leti barakna fiha. Sulaiman, he would direct the wind to blow towards the Holy Land, to, towards Jerusalem. It could be that he was commanding the wind to blow in certain directions to spread seeds, to spread the pollen in the Holy Land, in that blessed land. In another ayah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surah Saba, ayah number 12, وَلِسُلَيْمَانَ الرِّيحِ غَدُوهَا شَهْرٌ وَرَوَاحُهَا شَهْرٌ 
It conveyed him in the morning the distance of a month. You know, Suleiman would get into his ship. What would take a month, he would travel the distance of one month in one morning. And in the evening, he would cover the distance because he, because he could accelerate the speed of the wind. He could manipulate its direction and he could manipulate its speed. So in one day, according to this ayah, Sulaiman could travel what, no, what it would normally take two months in a single day. He's using what we would call today technology to increase efficiency. And there's nothing wrong with that. Using that type of divine knowledge to increase productivity and efficiency, there's no problem with that. And this is what King Suleiman does. Can you imagine if the United States of America had the ability to control wind? What would they do for humanity? Believe me, they would send, they would export hurricanes to the rest of the world. They would use that power in a very destructive way. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He tells us that Sulaiman alayhi salam, when I give him that type of power, he uses it in a productive way. He doesn't use it to destroy and to annihilate entire populations. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He says that I made the wind subservient to Sulaiman. And then in ayah 37, and this is very interesting, وَالشَّيَاطِينَ كُلَّ بَنَّاءٍ وَغَوَّاصٍ not only did Allah make the wind subservient to Sulaiman, Allah says, I made the devils subservient to him. And I made them do what? I made them construct things for him. And I made them gawas. I would make them sea divers for him. They would extract precious stones and minerals from the earth. And there are other shayateen who would be bound in chains. Now this ayah requires a bit of reflection. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that I made shayateen serve the vision and the agenda of Sulaiman. With their will, against their will, the shayateen, the corrupt ones among the jinn, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made them in a material form and they were subjugated by Sulaiman. They were forced to serve Sulaiman whether they liked it or not. Now this is also a very important lesson for us. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, sometimes He serves the cause of prophets through the efforts of wicked people. What do I mean? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is so powerful that He makes wicked people do the work of God without them even realizing it. They're motivated by their own selfish interests, but they don't realize that they are unknowingly serving the master plan of Allah. I'll give you an example. Fir'aun, Fir'aun built one of the greatest civilizations, the Egyptian civilization. Fir'aun, was challenged by Musa when Musa came and he said, I'm a messenger of God, and he showed him the staff. And the staff turned into a serpent in the court of Fir'aun. Now Musa comes to Egypt and he doesn't have a marketing team. He's by himself with his brother. They don't have anything with them. The only one who sees the mu'jizah of Fir'aun is, of, of Musa is Fir'aun. 
But because of his ego, what does he do? He says, okay, Musa, you're a sorcerer. I'm going to organize a big event. And I'm going to summon all of the sorcerers. And I'm going to... We're going to have a showdown between Musa and the magicians. Fir'aun didn't realize that he was basically doing all of the logistical and the marketing work for the mu'jizah of Musa. The only reason why all of Egypt heard about the miracle of Musa is because Fir'aun arranged the event. He inadvertently advanced the cause of Musa. And something similar will happen to Imam al-Mahdi. And in fact, if you look at the civilization that, that Fir'aun built, what happened to that civilization after he drowned? He built these palaces, he built all of these institutions, he developed the economy, and then Allah says what? كَذَلِكَ وَأَوْرَثْنَاهَا قَوْمًا آخَرِينَ Fir'aun, he built, 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 and Allah says, and we caused other people to inherit it all. Bani Israel, they inherited it. When you look at the world today, the Donald Trumps of the world, the Bidens, all of these world leaders who are building their countries and they're investing and the Elon Musks of the world. Do you know what they're actually doing? They don't, they don't realize it, they don't know it. But they're actually building all of the infrastructure so Imam Sahib al-Zaman can take it over. They're working. They're doing all of the legwork. Allah removes them and He hands it to His wali. Here, who is serving Sulaiman? The shayateen. The shayateen are working for him. And this is how Allah deals with these people. He puts them to work whether they like it or not. They will end up serving the cause of God. So everything that happens in this world, it's not escaping the plan of God. Now what did Sulaiman have them build? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surah Saba, Surah 34, Ayah 13. يَعْمَلُونَ لَهُ مَا يَشَاء they would build and construct for Sulaiman whatever he wished. And among the things that Sulaiman was investing in was what? يَعْمَلُونَ لَهُ مَا يَشَاءُ مِنْ مَحَارِيب Number one, Sulaiman had them built maharib, which is the plural of mihrab. Now there are two opinions here. There are some that say Maharib are temples. In the kingdom of Sulaiman, he was investing in the development of centers of learning and spirituality. Maharib are places where people learn how to become good human beings. There was an investment in education and spirituality. Look at world leaders today. Do they invest in education? No, they invest in the military. Because they want dumb citizens. And it's reflected even in how much teachers get paid. It's not a priority for most governments. Education is not a priority for them. Because these are countries that are run by godless people. In the government of Sulaiman, among the priorities is what? The building of maharib. The building of temples. What happens in temples? Education, enlightenment, spirituality. And some say that no, maharib comes from mihrab, which means the place of harb. That he was building defense systems to protect the homeland. It's important to protect and to be strong and to have enough technological power to deter your enemies from invading you. يَعْمَلُونَ لَهُ مَا يَشَاءُ مِنْ مَحَارِبْ وَتَمَاثِيلِ He also invested in the building of sculptures. Not human sculptures. Suleiman is not going to build something that 
could cause people to devolve into idol worship. Imam al-Sadiq says he would build and he would oversee the building of sculptures of nature, trees. And so here, Sulaiman is also investing in what? In the arts, the aesthetics. Sulaiman wants to build beautiful cities. And this is part of Islam. Inna Allah jameelun yuhibbul jamal. Allah is beautiful and Allah loves beauty. Our mosques should be beautiful. Everything that we design should have this element of beauty, of jamal. And then what does the ayah say? وَجَفَانٍ كَالْجَوَابِ وَقُدُورٍ rasiat. And he would also have them construct bowls the size of small pools and cauldrons fixed in the earth. Meaning that these are containers of food. Sulaiman alayhi salam was ramping up food production. He was building facilities where food would be distributed to the less fortunate. Sulaiman, he took care of the farmers. He took care of the people who were growing food. Today, you walk in the supermarket, 90% of what is being sold is not food. Food is... You, if you want to have food, you should look for one ingredient types of foods. I'm not talking about bars and chips. These, this is not food. These are all chemicals. This is not food. Sulaiman is building infrastructures where he's in increasing production of food and distribution of food because Sulaiman knows that if you have people who are poor, they're going to be more prone to corruption. You can't expect people to develop their spirituality if they're hungry, if they're suffering economically. This was Sulaiman alayhi salam. Sulaiman had an agenda to lift people out of literal poverty and spiritual poverty. This was the government of Sulaiman. And that's why it's important for us when we read these ayat, how many of us have read this ayah? Maybe dozens of times. There is so much provided in these verses in terms of a vision for governance, a vision for what a society looks like, but we don't read with reflection. We don't ponder. Now there is, there is much more to say, but I'll, I'll try to conclude in the next five minutes. Sulaiman alayhi salam, he was a king, and he carried himself like a king. Meaning that he understood that he had to project power on the international stage. He used to wear regal garments, but underneath those regal garments, the narrations say, Kana Sulaiman, ma'ama huwa fihi min al mulk yalbasu al his outer garments were for the role that he was playing. He was a king. He had to represent the kingdom of God on earth. A government that was based on tawheed. Because first impressions matter. The way that you present yourself to the rest of the world, it matters. That's why Imam al-Rida in Khurasan, he was dressed in a very regal manner. Not because he was obsessed with dunya, because he understood the importance of optics on the international stage. But what he wore under those garments, just like Sulaiman, he wore very simple clothing. The outer garments were for the people. The inner garments were an expression of his humility before Allah. That's the way that he really wanted to dress. He felt and he knew that he was nothing but a servant of God. And in fact, just like his father, he did not take a stipend from Baytul Mal. He was a king. He was the king of kings. But he used to work with his hands. He used to sow straw mats and he would sell them. And the food, the money that he would earn, he would feed himself through it. وَإِذَا جَنَّهُ اللَّيْلِ And at night time, 
Most kings, they're drinking and partying at night, but not Sulaiman. When everyone is asleep, Sulaiman would stand. He would actually tie his hands to his neck. Probably to remind himself that, Oh Sulaiman, be careful. There are many people who have this type of power, who had even less power than this. And they let the dunya get the best of them. It's as though he wanted that visual reminder that you are a lowly slave of God. He would stand in his mihrab until the night. And he would cry. And he would cry. Because Sulaiman understood that power is not a gift. Power is, it doesn't mean that Allah favors you. Power is a great responsibility. He knows that he has to answer and he's responsible for all of his subjects. If there is a hungry person in his empire, he knows that the buck stops with him. He's in a, lead, in a leadership position. And he would cry, begging Allah that, Oh Allah, I'm doing my best. If there's anyone who is oppressed in my kingdom, who, who I am unaware of, forgive me, pardon me. This was Sulaiman salam. And there's much to learn from this great personality. You know, it is said, and I'll just end with this one hadith, and then I'll speak for a few minutes about Sayyidah Khadija. Sulaiman one day was passing with his entourage. And the narrations say that there was a farmer who was just watching his entourage from the distance. This farmer was probably, you know, plowing the land. It was a hot day, doing all of this manual labor. And he sees Sulaiman in his pomp and his glory. And he says to himself, he whispers to himself that, I wish I had the kingdom of Sulaiman. The wind carried those words to the ears of Sulaiman. And Sulaiman, he comes down from his seat and he walks over to the farmer. فَنَزَلَ وَمَشَى إِلَى الْحَارِثُ وَقَالْ إِنَّمَا مَشِيتُ إِلَيْكِ لِأَلَّا تَتَمَنَّا مَا لَا تَقْدِرُ عَلَيْهِ Sulaiman says, the reason why I've come to you is to convince you that you shouldn't seek things that you don't have the capacity to bear. You just see the good side of kingship. But you don't you don't know the weight of this responsibility. And then he says to him, let me tell you something that I want you to keep with you. Whenever you see me or you see any king, he says, لَتَسْبِيحَةٌ وَاحِدًا يَقْبَلَهَ اللَّهُ تَعَالَى خَيْرٌ مِمَّا أُوْتِيَ آلُ دَاوُود Sulaiman, he says to him, O farmer, know that one tasbiha that Allah accepts, it is better than what Allah has given the household of Dawood in terms of kingship. Why? Because the reward for an accepted tasbih lasts forever. The reward of tasbih is forever. But the kingdom of Sulaiman will one day perish. This is a lesson for all of us. We're not just talking about the kingdom of Sulaiman. Someone drives by and you see a, a Bentley or a Lamborghini and you think to myself, oh, I wish I had that. No, 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 no. The iman that you have in your heart, the tasbih that you make to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it's worth the dunya and everything in it. And especially the wilaya of Ahlul Bayt, my dear brothers and sisters, this wilaya that you have, believe me, you know, we don't realize its value now. We will realize it when we stand on the day of judgment before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
We're very blessed. We're a very blessed community to come together in these holy nights in the month of Ramadan to share some reflections on the Quran. But you know, when I look at all of these faces, especially the youth and my respected sisters, when I see all of these faces, do you know who I think about, especially on a night like this? I think about the sacrifices of that woman who ensured the survival of the message of Tawheed. Because if it wasn't for Khadija, believe me, most of us would probably be pagans today. If it wasn't for Khadija, the dhikr of La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah, it would have just been this religious movement over a thousand years ago that just faded away, just like the thousands of religions that were invented and fade away. In this night, we are commemorating someone who is very beloved to the Prophet. Someone who was so beloved to the Prophet that, you know, brothers and sisters, when you read the biography of the Prophet, Rasulullah lost many people. He lost Ja'far in the battle of Mu'tah. He lost Hamza in the battle of Uhud. He had to bury his own children. But when he lost Khadija, it was different. When he lost Hamza, he never called the third year of Hijrah, the year of grief. When he lost Ja'far ibn Abi Talib, even though he loved him very much, the great martyr of Mu'tah, he never called that year the year of grief. When he lost Khadija, when he lost Khadija, that was the year of grief. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa deeply loved this woman. And it was not just the love between a husband and a wife. It was the love of a man who felt that he, have, he had the privilege of living side by side with one of the greatest worshipers of God in human history. Someone who loved the Prophet so much that before anyone even knew who he was and knew how special he was, she would climb Jabal and nur to deliver him food. Brothers and sisters, Khadija was so rich that she was called the princess of Quraysh. She doesn't send her dozens of servants to go deliver food. She wanted to go up there to see him in that state. To see that glowing face of the Prophet as he's immersed in the remembrance of Allah. My dear brothers and sisters, I was asked by the, the fundraising committee to just share a few words with you. And I know that you are not a community that needs to be told to give. We come from a school where Ahlul Bayt and their followers, they don't need to be told to give. They give willingly, they give without even being asked. These programs, my dear brothers and sisters, are not possible without your support. And these sessions, they have great value with Imam Ja'far al-Sadiq. Imam Ja'far al-Sadiq salam, he says to Fudayl, Ya Fudayl, tajlisuna wa tatahaddathun. Do you Shia, do you come together and speak and converse. He says, yes, we do have sessions of remembrance. Imam al-Sadiq says, Tilka al-majalis uhibbuha. Imam al-Sadiq says, I love, I love those gatherings. And if Imam al-Sadiq says, I love these gatherings, it means Imam Sahib al-Zaman also loves these gatherings. And Imam al-Sadiq then he says, Ya Fudayl, ahyu amrana. O Fudayl, revive our affairs. Our names should always be mentioned in your gatherings. Our stories, our words, our legacy 
should remain on your tongues. And brothers and sisters, this masjid, and of course there are many noble causes to donate to, but this is one of those places where we come together and we hear the name of Jafar Sadiq. We hear the name of Musa ibn Jafar. We hear the name of Ali. We hear the name of Rasulullah. We hear the ayat of the Quran. And we have a responsibility of ensuring that these gatherings continue. So I'm not asking for a donation. I'm not asking for a donation. What, what I'm asking is to support sessions that Imam al-Sadiq says, I love these sessions. And I think that the shortfall for the, fund, Ramadan, the month of Ramadan fundraising campaign is 35000 it's not a very significant amount. I think if each and every one of us even makes a small contribution before the nights of Qadr, I think that we can reach the, the fundraising goal. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless us and to guide us. And I pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that He makes us little mirrors that reflect the illustrious light of Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad in this life. And I ask Allah azza wa to grant us their shafa'a, their intercession on the day of judgment. يَوْمَ لَا يَنْفَعُ مَالٌ وَلَا بَنُونٌ إِلَّا مَنْ أَتَى اللَّهِ بِقَلْبٍ سَلِيمٌ وَآخِرُ دَعْوَانًا الْحَمْدُ لِلَّهِ رَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ وَصَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَى مُحَمَّدٍ وَآلِهِ الطَّاهِرِينَ